Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Wonder Goal, the soccer betting podcast from the Action Network. My name is Michael Lieboff. Joining me tonight, as always, uh, my friends and colleagues, BJ Cunningham and Anthony DeBundo. Uh, and before I bring those two guys in, just a reminder, Wonder Goal is proudly presented by Bet365, the world's favorite sportsbook brand. Sign up with promo code ACTION to get Bet365's exclusive sign-up offer. Bet $1 on any game and get $200 in bonus bets. You must be 21 or older. The offer is available in Colorado, New Jersey, Ohio, and the Commonwealth of Virginia in the United States. And if you have a gambling problem, please call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. And always remember uh, to gamble responsibly. Anthony, BJ, we're here to talk about the second legs of the Champions League semifinal. The road to Istanbul, as it's marketed to the masses. Eurovision is now in the books, so this is what everybody is now talking about. Congratulations to Sweden on another win at Eurovision, which was in Liverpool, actually. Uh, it was supposed to be in Ukraine, but the goings on there, man. The UK kind of hosted it for them, and it seemed like there was some controversy. Maybe Finland should have should have got the nod, but I digress, and I'll just stop it there. We'll talk City and Real Madrid first. Uh, even though this game is on Wednesday, City is minus one sixty seven on the three way money line at home. Real Madrid plus four twenty five. The draw is plus three twenty. To advance, City minus three fifty. Madrid plus two fifty. If you're going to bet Real Madrid to advance, if you're going to bet Real Madrid to win the Champions League or anything like that, just bet them on the three-way money line is what I would say. Um, I see no value here on Manchester City. I think that the number looks a little scary uh, just considering the sample that we have with this Real Madrid team. I don't think... I think that because... We're and Anthony especially trust the process guys. He's a Sixers guy, so he's very much trust the process. And we look at all these numbers and try to parse out the data and say like this team is overperforming. This team is voodoo, smoke and mirrors. But this team that has the good numbers and the better numbers are not, not not like Real Madrid will always look to people like you, Ustery, like a little underwhelming compared to. Manchester City, Liverpool uh, of last year, whoever you want to throw in there. But they now have the sample size of just punching above their weight in these kind of one-off spots. I would not go anywhere near City at this number. I actually think Madrid at better than 4-1 to one on the three-way line is worth a little look. And Anthony, you disagree. And I, I just don't understand how many times this team can do this to you so please take the floor well uh you know michael you weren't here last week we missed you we need you to come tell us why real madrid is going to win uh but uh, bj and i both said we thought that city was overvalued in the first leg uh the market was too high on them and honestly a very even soccer match played out uh that ended in a draw and i thought a fair result one one being about right you know two piss missile goals but otherwise not a ton happening at either end uh, I, I I just wonder, we saw the opening 20 minutes of that first match, the first leg Tuesday, and we saw Real Madrid trying to play out from the back under pressure and completely failing and getting away with it in the end. I am very skeptical that that will work again at the Etihad. I think they're going to have major problems playing out from the pressure. We've seen this with Real Madrid on the road in the Champions League, even this season. Even when I've said that Real Madrid is better this year than they were last year, which is true, uh, that Real Madrid's underlying numbers are better this year than they were last year, which is also true that Vinicius has taken another step forward. Uh, and even though Benzema hasn't been as dominant from a finishing perspective, he's been good once again. Rodrigo adding, you know, that, that third score punch. Camavinga, the left back situation. He did go off with an injury against Getafe on Saturday. That would be a really huge loss. It doesn't necessarily seem that he's out, out. We'll have to wait and see. That would be a big loss given the lack of depth they have there. And Camavinga and Vinicius uh, really created all of Real Madrid's success in the first leg in, in terms of getting through pressure. Look at Kyle Walker's face after the game, like talking to Camavinga is just priceless stuff, man. It was just a real recognized, real kind of situation. Yeah. And Vinicius too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 
And Walker was great. I mean, again, the goal came from Kamavinga beating a press, dribbling through, finding Vinicius in the center of the pitch, not uh, out wide against Walker. So I thought that was notable. But really, it's a matter of City at this point is now a little bit overpriced. I agree. Uh, I ran my projections before the, the second, the first leg, because I knew we were going to get an opener right, right away when the match ended. I projected City uh, minus 149 after some adjustments, minus 152. So when City opened minus 130, if you follow me in the app, you saw that I bet it. I still like them up to minus 140. I'm going to pass at this number. If you want to look in terms of like props, I think what we saw in the first leg from City defensively was it was quite impressive, actually. Uh, you know, holding this team to, you know, 0.65 XG, uh, you know, in Real, Real Madrid going over that shot total on like the last flurry when when City had run out of gas. Uh, I think City to win to nil is probably the angle that I would look uh, if I had to bet this currently, uh, because I, I really think that as good as Vinicius is, Walker has shown time and time again now, remember, Kylian Mbappe in the World Cup in the quarterfinal, Mbappe had his worst match against Kyle Walker. We now saw Vinicius, who was relatively quiet, except for you know that moment, of course, scores a banger. Good for him. Um, but I think that's the angle to approach this. I uh, think you're going to see a lot of overs. You're going to see everybody say, oh, you know, just how we, everybody who bet the over in the first leg is now going to say, well, you know, first leg, they're always cagey, but the second leg surely will go over. I don't agree with that. Uh, I think this is a cagey affair. That's why I don't want to lay the goal, which is basically we have to lay now with City. Um, so that's where I'm at. Uh, before you get to BJ, um, uh, the other thing I want to mention and throw back towards you, Anthony, is I don't know in 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 a when you're betting a Premier League season, right? You're betting 38 matches and you're the t- these teams really don't change their stripes much until, you know, of, of course like coaches coming in and out or whatever. Uh but so intangible stuff really doesn't matter all that much until you get to the nitty-gritty, the business end of the season, the deep end of the pool, when relegation and title stuff, whatever. But in this match, all the pressure in the world is on Manchester City. All of it. Like, yep. Real Madrid has won, just won the Champions League last year as an underdog. They've won, they won back-to-back-to-back Champions League titles. And, and I know a lot of these players weren't on that team. Uh, but the, as a club, like, there's not going to be all that much pressure on this team to, to win this match. This is house money situation. Manchester City's never won this title. They've never made it to the final. And as betters, we're final. kind of... It's it's almost derided as a archaic and kind of you know old too old school to, to handicap that kind of stuff in. But I actually think it matters here, like, a lot. And it's part of the reason why I think getting Real Madrid at these numbers is, is worth it because they should be the looser side and these are human beings playing a soccer match in front of the entire world. I certainly see that point. I mean, if you are a Sixer fan like myself and you just watch James Harden implode in game seven again, you could yeah, say, he's oh, he's one well, of the best so 10 best players he's in the always world, been right? Bad right? Game seven, but like, like what who could have seen that but, coming? But yeah, exactly. But so and, like, and, and I could see myself all these in players an hour, for... after an hour of the match being like, how did I not see this coming? City right. missing chance. But, but does Holland make a difference there? That's the it question. Might, I mean, Holland was quiet in the first leg. Rudiger, did an excellent job. They will have Militao back. I don't know that he starts. Uh, Rudiger and uh, Alaba uh, were very yeah. good in the first leg. I think that will be interesting. But I think, yes, on like a macro scale, the pressure coming into the match, pressure will be on Manchester City because they have to exercise those demons, or exercise those demons. But in the actual playing of the match, like Real Madrid trying to play out under pressure was a problem at Liverpool. It was a problem at Chelsea. And they got pantsed in the first half of both of those matches. And I think that there's a real chance that happens again here. Uh, so, uh, and we, we've seen this from City too. Uh, even in this Champions League, they went to Leipzig in the first leg. They really didn't play well. They played a very even kind of low event, 1-1 one, one game. We had we all had Leipzig in that match. And then we said, all right, well, second leg, you know, I think Leipzig uh, could maybe do some of the same things, keep this competitive. We all bet Leipzig. Uh, they got destroyed. And bet. why? They kept turning it over in their own half, trying to play out under the city press. Um, 
and it's just harder to do on the road. Uh, I think it's, you know, what, what could end up happening here. I don't know, but that's my read on it. Again, not laying the goal. Cause I, th- I do think this is back at, at very cagey. And the same thing we said about Real Madrid last match, which is like, they're better in the big moments because they have Courtois who we know is an elite shot stopper. And Ederson has been kind of mid this year. Uh, like those things still work in their favor. The voodoo works in their favor, but it, uh, from a numbers perspective, I can't get to Madrid either. I would need plus one and a quarter to bet Real Madrid. And then I would probably do it. Shame. All right, BJ, uh, you're looking, you KG, I think is a pretty good word for you to, to kind of leapfrog off of as well. Yeah. Under three minus one ten. I think it's still kind of inflated. And I mean, I actually was very impressed with Real Madrid in that first leg i mean they are just the second team this season to hold city under one expected goal the only team that, was, that did it was manchester united at old trafford in the second meeting now what was actually very impressive about it is that the way they defended in and around their penalty area. so city had that big flurry at the beginning then from the 19th minute to the 55th minute city didn't even attempt a shot and there were countless times that Real Madrid sent really since they were defending most of the match and, you know, city had controlled 55% possession where they were dropping five, even six guys into the back line to really defend in and around their penalty area. And guess what? City only had three shots in the penalty area and an expected threat of 1.07. Like that is incredibly impressive stuff to do to the best attacking team in the world. And listen, I, I'm gonna have to disagree with your point about playing out of the back for Real Madrid, Anthony, because I thought they did actually a very impressive job of doing so in the first leg. And yes, it might be a problem here in the second leg playing away from home, but City's pass per defensive action was only 12.7 and Real Madrid had a buildup completion percentage of 86.5%. Those are well above where City's average is at in the Premier League. So Real Madrid obviously has, what I believe is they're going to come out in that very type defensive low block like we saw in the first leg when they were defending that lead they might drop five guys into the back line i agree with you i don't know if militao is actually going to play in this one i think alaba and uh rudiger is a fine back too and they did a really good job so and i think it just sets up perfectly for real madrid to play in transition where they're at their best where they've punished city a lot of time many times in the last you know obviously in the last meeting they the goal came in transition last year in both legs that venetius jr was very dangerous in transition so I love under three goals at minus 110. I mean, there were 1.2 total expected goals off of 23 shots in the first leg. So, and the total hasn't changed at all, essentially. So, and yes, I get it. Like people are going to like, oh yeah, of course, you know, this match is going to go over it. But once the first goal goes in, I mean, think about it. What have we known about Pep for his entire career as a manager? In situations like this, he wants control. He wants game control. He wants and so that ends up meaning that City plays a very slow-paced game and actually favors Real Madrid too because then they can sit back, they defend, because they obviously don't press with the intensity that some teams like Liverpool or other teams, that are, you know, City has played through them. So I like under three at minus 110. I only project 2.6 goals. I don't really see a reason to, to back anything less if – it was such a low event type match in the first leg. So under three at minus 110. Yeah, I think the biggest question, like, you know, did Madrid find something with Holland or did he just have a bad match? That's one question we don't really necessarily know the answer to. But I will say, I'm kind of curious. It's not that Real Madrid couldn't build out from the back against City. Like there was the early stretch where they couldn't. But it's can they do it again at, at the Etihad that I'm more like eh, kind of doubtful about because um, yeah, that's we'll um, going to be a problem. And I mean, here's the thing is like, you know, Madrid knows what City's doing in build-up play. He, they know they're doing a 3-2-5 and they're trying to try to compress that back line. And you saw it on Sunday, like Everton did a decent job for a while. And then as the match goes on, it becomes more difficult to defend five guys in the box constantly. So uh, we'll see. But I mean, Real Madrid, I mean, they didn't allow City into the penalty box. And that's kind of what you have to do with them. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. So we'll see what happens in the second leg. But it's... uh. It's very, 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 very interesting second line coming up. Okay, onto Tuesday. Uh, Inter and AC Milan. Inter up 2 nothing. Coming uh, home. On aggregate. Coming home. <laughs> coming home. Uh, Hostile uh, environment. Yeah. Look out. And a lot of travel. Uh, Inter is plus 105. Milan, 3-1. to one. Uh, The draw is plus 225 on the three-way line. Milan is 12 to 1 to advance. Inter minus 
uh, twenty five hundred. I think what the what I said about the Madrid match, the opposite is true here. If you're gonna bet Milan to win on the three way line, you might as well just take the twelve to one shot on them to advance here. I think two nothing gets painted as a an insurmountable situation sometimes, and I th- don't think that's accurate here. I know we're all kind of in agreement, and we're in agreement that Inter's a better team than um, Milan that showed in the first leg. Of course, like the Liao injury comes into play, uh, but this is kind of an upstart Milan team, like. I think when you're down to nothing, you similar to Madrid, like you could kind of play with a little bit more, uh, you know, freedom, take more risks. You got to, you kind of have to throw everything you can, uh, at the tie to to come back and erase a a two goal deficit. So I actually don't hate looking towards Milan here and I liked Inter in the, the first leg I wrote up an article for the, the New York Post our partnership there about uh, Inter being worth a shot in, in the first leg and it was true but I think that I'll flip here because getting 12-1 mm-hmm. to 1 on Milan to, to erase this I just don't think it's out of the question this isn't yeah. they're not Inter's not some like super elite team. They weren't considered one coming into the tournament. What were they to come in? Like 50. 30, 50. Yeah. And then they were like 33 to one at the beginning of the knockout stages or so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 34. Thir- yeah. I happen to know that. Do you well, have a ticket, Anthony? No, nah, I have not mentioned it, but I'm very excited about it. Yeah. So we're going to lose the final, obviously, but yeah, obviously. I have a, I have an AC Milan 22 to one ticket. That's yeah. not well, drawing dead, Michael. No, I don't think so. BJ. I really don't. And I mean, here, getting into it, I think there are some interesting aspects where Milan can make a comeback. I think it all depends on if Leal is going to play or not. Uh, If he doesn't, I don't think they have a shot. But I mean, this is the second time now where we've seen Inter going into a second leg with the lead. The first time against Porto, they were incredibly passive and, you know, essentially saw a 1-0 lead. And then against Benefica, they had a two-goal lead coming home. And they were up 3-1 and they conceded twice late to get a miracle cover from Benfica. But one thing that Milan did in that first leg, and I understand Inter scored early twice, so it kind of changes the whole complexion of the match and what goes on. But something that AC Milan wasn't able to do in all three of the previous meetings when Inter was the better team is they were not able to disrupt Inter's build-up play. Like their pass per defense action was always over 10. They would not force any high turnovers. Well, in the match against Inter, I mean, they had a pass per defensive action of 6.7 and had five high turnovers. So they were actually very good at disrupting that build-up play, and that's something that they did a really good job against Napoli in both legs in the quarterfinals as well. But for me, I mean, it's crazy because, again, (laughs) we're playing the match at the exact same stadium. Inter was plus 150 in the first leg. And now we're coming back. They have a two goal lead and Inter is sitting there plus 110 now at most books. So I agree with you. Now you're, you get a flip it the other way and you're saying, okay, why don't I take AC Milan plus a half? And the game theory says that Inter is going to sit on this lead. And then obviously what happened against Benefica when they went up three, one kind of gives you a little bit of pause. But for me, it just depends on if Leao is going to play. But for the last match, I said, if Leao was out at Inter at plus 108, if he plays, I have Inter at plus 132. That projection hasn't really changed a whole lot just because of that one match. So for me, it's all dependent on layout. If he plays, I like AC Milan plus a half. If he doesn't, I'm just going to pass. So that's where I'm at. I mean, the San Siro, right? It's 75-25. First leg, 75%. AC Milan, second leg. But other than that, it's, it's the entire same situation. exact same thing. Yeah. Uh, so... I agree with BJ on 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 Milan. Uh, I think uh, it was encouraging how they played after going down 2-0. I know that sounds dumb, and really they could have been down 3 or 4 with how bad it was. But the problem was, as much as they're going to have to press, Inter still has an ability in transition, mm-hmm. I think, to get yeah. at this Milan team, especially now that Benacer is out. Because we talked about Liao all last week, 
and how important he is to ball progression and chance creation. And he is everything. I mean, if you watched the match against Spezia that they played on <laughs> Saturday, it wasn't any better. No. They lost 2-0 at Spezia. They created like 0.6 XG. It was ugly, ugly, ugly. Probably cost themselves top four. Inter, you know, has the depth, has the uh, just more widespread attacking ability that they're able to somewhat rotate and still win comfortably against the Swolo. But I think, why do we not like the over? Because a really passive Inter against a Milan press feels like a situation where maybe Milan sneaks a goal or two, but also Inter's a, Inter's going to have a field day in transition. Uh, and Inter hasn't been good at shutting these games down. Like you said, they conceded uh, three to Benfica, you know, granted two were late, but we're under the pressure against Benfica. And against Porto, it took like an Onana masterclass to save that 1-0 lead. So I think their problems in, in transition, uh, or Milan's problems in transition defense without Liao, big flag, big red, or without Benacer, big red flag. And then Port, like Inter's defense, like I, you know, bet them to win this tournament because I thought they were a very good defense coming in and they've been pretty good overall, but they have not been good when they try to change their style and protect leads. So I like uh, over here, two and a half plus 115, 120. First leg at over three XG. It should have gone way over. So uh, I don't think a ton necessarily changes from that. Okay. Uh, that's the Champions League. Let's talk quickly about Europa League. Thursday, Bayer Leverkusen down 1-0 on aggregate, now host Roma. Uh, Leverkusen is an even money home favorite. On the three-way line, uh, Roma plus 290 draw, plus 240. And then the other match is Sevilla against Juve. That one is tied 1-1. One, one. Uh, God, you know, it's, you know it's nuts. So last year when we first started this podcast, we talked about Sevilla in the Champions League. Mm -hmm. or and we this was even before wonder goal was like officially called wonder goal we did a champions league preview and we talked sevilla as a tournament team uh if i have the right podcast right down uh, and then they they were bad and didn't do much and then this year they've been terrible and look where they are yeah it's just it's just that that tournament that tournament pedigree has shown up anyways they're one one against juve uh, Sevilla is plus 140. Uh, at home, Juve plus 210 and the draw plus 220. Uh, you both have a play in Sevilla and Juve, so we'll just start there. Uh, BJ, let's let's go with you. Yeah, I mean, I had over two and a half in the first leg. There were 3.6 expected goals created, and uh, it ended 1-1. And it kind of played out how we expected. We have two defenses that have been poor, who can't press, who just let teams into their final third. And that's kind of what happened. Juve controlled a lot of possession, and then Sevilla was was very good in transition, which is something that they've done very well throughout the Europa League, not so much in La Liga, because teams tend to set up very, very defensive, low blocky. Well, Juventus really isn't that, really is not that this season especially. So I see no reason. I'm going to change it up. I'm going to go both teams to score in this leg at minus 115 just in case we have another 1-1 one, one, uh, draw and go into extra time. But, I mean, it's very game state dependent, right? Because once that first goal goes in, you kind of saw it with Juventus too. It kind of kicked them into high gear. Like, oh, crap, we're down 1-0. We got to control more possession. We got to get the ball into the final third. I mean, Sevilla, credit to them. I mean, they outshot Juventus 11-3 to in the first half. Like, they were incredibly impressive in transition. So, I see no reason why not to back you the over or both teams to score here in the second leg? Uh, I'm expecting another very high event style match. So both teams to score a minus 115 for me. Yeah, I'm I'm going to take Sevilla drawn a bet here. And I'm kind of mad I didn't take them in the first leg. I also had the over with BJ. Brutal loss. Both teams mm -hmm. to score got in on a miracle, if we're being honest. They should yeah. not have been playing that match still. Uh, yep. Juve obviously appeared to have... Uh, lucked out once again, getting the ref to give them an extra couple minutes to try to get that goal, uh, which is amazing. Anyway, like Sevilla look like the better team throughout all of the first leg. They look like they have a better plan and attack and they're much more successful at executing that plan. The one time we need Vlaovic to score, he misses a sitter of all sitters into an empty net. Yep. Um, so, you know, it's classic. He'll score two in this one. Uh, I agree with BJ on the over. This Juventus defense continues to run so well 
Uh, and from a matchup perspective, I think this is just good for Sevilla at home as a pick'em, uh, where they've been very good in European play. And you know, we've we've shit on Sevilla a lot, and for good reason. But they have started to write the ship, figure some things out. It hasn't been <laughs> relegation level form. It was relegation level form for the first, you know, pre World Cup through maybe January. Uh, but they, you know, this is why we use priors. Like they have regressed a little bit back toward those priors uh, and been like the eighth best team in Spain, even in just Spain matches only uh, since February. So you're starting to see some improvement, mostly been driven by the attack. Attack's gotten better and the series been healthier. They've kind of sorted through, you know, their problems with not having a true goal score by getting him to score more goals. Uh, and uh, it's it's been uh, effective. So like they haven't been as bad in the mm-hmm. last uh, two months as they were you know, the first seven. You know, it's crazy. They're one point off a conference league spot in La Liga right now. And they're five and they are five points off a Europa League spot as well. If Betis loses to Vallecano on Monday. So yeah. I mean, I agree. They have right the ship. And even if you look at their expected goals numbers, like they did overperform for quite a while where they had scored like 15 off of five expected, but I mean, I scored three goals against a really bad valid lead team on Sunday the two prior matches before that in La Liga, they created a combined 4.7 expected goals. So, and Jesus Corona is back too. It gives him more, another winger option. So yeah, I agree. It's, I, I have, yeah. I have, I've led the charge of shitting on Sevilla this season. So I will credit where credit's due. They have been better as of late. I don't know if you guys saw the Valladolid game today. I did not, but I saw the highlight on Twitter and the referee, so there's like a, a free kick into the did, box. Yeah, I saw that. The too, second yeah. that the first header comes out of the box, the ref blows the halftime whistle as the Vida lead player is running onto it to strike it. He scores, but because the whistle blew like not even a second before the shot was attempted, goal didn't count, and they lost 3-0. It was uh, remarkable. I have never seen anything like that, to be honest. Sevilla luck. I've seen like, oh, a team's about to have a three-on-one and the ref blows. I've never seen guy is about to shoot. And he blows for halftime. <laughs> <laughs> I love. I, we, hey, this is why we love this game, man. <laughs> I'll never forget uh, when I was playing travel soccer. We had a situation like that in uh, our league cup game, a semifinal game, and we had like a four on two. We turned the ball over in the midfield, a four on two, and the the winger made a perfect like late a pass like across the middle of the box to a late runner. And as the ball is coming like perpendicular to him and he's about to lace it, whistle blew. And that's how we got eliminated. Uh, I think it was like 13. So it stuck with me. And any time a ref does that, like blows a game or a half on a corner or a play like that, that play comes back to my mind and haunts me still. Uh, okay. So uh, Leverkusen and Roma, Anthony, you're the only one with a play here. Uh, and no surprise who, would, who you're back at. I mean, what did we see in the first leg that made us think Roma was uh, worse than Leverkusen? Because I thought that was a very controlled performance. They gave up two early chances, like the first five minutes, uh, to to Holzek and Verts, and after that, it was pretty much like Roma just controlling the game. Roma gets to be in their preferred game state now, defending the penalty area, looking for transition opportunities, daring Leverkusen to break down a set defense, which they're not nearly as good at. Uh, I like Roma plus a half here. I'm not going to add more to my own position, you know, the team of the pod, but uh, this is a very clear rotation plan too from Jose. Like they punted top four. They've been rotating their team out in, in Syria preparing for this run. And uh, we're now nearing a potential Roma Sevilla Europa league final. If the, if the chalk holds this weekend. So it will certainly be uh, interesting nevertheless, but hopefully we can just get a draw. Get out, get our one one or our nil nil and get to the final. They asked Jose after the game, uh, in the zero zero draw against Bologna, what they what they thought of his top four hopes being over. And he's like, I've been saying for three months we were never gonna get top four. So <laughs> it's pretty clear they're focused on Europa League. God, I love him. He's gonna be great at PSG next year. There we go. Uh pretty quick episode here. We're in the nitty gritty. We'll be back again on uh thursday morning to talk about how wonderfully we handicapped last week's premier league slate mm-hmm. can't believe you guys convinced me to bet everton um but until everton then was the right side <laughs> until then i, I uh, can't believe uh that arsenal lost that was a true shock nobody saw that coming yeah
only game I got right all weekend. Yeah. I think. Yeah. It's sad. You know what? It's it's like, you know, it's like watching one of your kids win against one of your other kids. Like it's, you know, you obviously have, you know, for parents out there have multiple kids, like you say you don't have a favorite, but you kind of do. Um and uh it's like watching you. Yeah. BJ, do you like, have a second kid I don't know about? I no, I don't. <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> no, but I'm like, I thought I only had one kid. Kids knows, every parent out there has two kids knows what I'm saying. So um it just it sucks. And there's no other way to put it other than sucks. Brighton pumped us. That's I tell you what though. Like Anthony said, nobody saw that one coming. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> Mighty Mighty Arsenal goes down at home. Uh, and it also sets up. I mean, right, we'll, we'll leave it here, but it it sets up a, just an absolutely uh, hilarious spot on on, <laughs> on Chelsea next weekend uh, against City, especially if oh, for the love of so, God, it's Chelsea. just such a good spot for oh. Chelsea, and it's but it's Chelsea. And Frank Anyways, Lam- and Frank no, Lampard, Frank, who has Frank, gotten a draw Frank against City. Frank dominates City. Frank dominates City. Draw you, will, City. you can say that. Um, Frank, anyways, Frank lost uh, his job at Chelsea after losing to City, but other than that, he has dominated them. <laughs> but he's back at Chelsea now, yeah, so exactly. it's all as well. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, that'll that'll do it for this episode. Good luck with your Champions League bets. We will see you again Thursday morning, where I can tell you, uh, you're going to be hearing a lot about Chelsea uh, against Manchester City on Sunday. Uh, for Anthony Dubondo, BJ Cunningham, thank you again to our sponsors, Bet Three Six Five. We will see you in a few days. 